Well, dear ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to our webinar on circular economy. My name is Christina Schreiber. I'm the delegate of the Catalan government to Central Europe. And uh, we have our office in Vienna where it's really warm this afternoon. So we're especially thankful that you're all sticking with us uh, in this webinar. And uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome such a variety of participants in the audience and also amongst our speakers who will be presented in short by Linda Osuski, a journalist based in Catalonia who writes for German media and who will conduct the event today. So a warm welcome to representatives of regional governments, of economic and business agencies, of private companies, of universities, and of civil society associations. And of course, a very big thank you uh, to our speakers who are four renowned personalities from different sectors who are going to share very generously their expertise and experience with us today on this topic. Now, also a warm thank you to the Vienna uh, University of Economics and Business because uh, it has made it possible this event today through its collaboration. And um, now this broad audience actually already shows that the topic of circular economy is obviously a topic that involves a broad variety of stakeholders. The EU Parliament has only recently approved an action plan to give support to a transition to, towards a more circular, circular economy model. Also, the Catalan government has made a big effort already since some time to participate in this transition. And now the questions are, for example, what actually means circular economy? What is a more circular economy model? And what are the challenges, not only for institutions, but also for the people on the ground, for the private companies? What are their experiences when they are starting to implement measures for more circular, circular economy model or when they're dedicated to circular economy? And what are the global experts' outlooks uh, on these uh, developments and what can we expect from the future? So these kinds of questions we hope to discuss today with our speakers and hopefully also with you and the question and answer round also from the delegation. I would really um, invite you to participate actively at the end. We want to hear your opinions. We want to hear your questions. And even though this is virtual, we always have the intention to also use this as a platform to give a platform to networking, especially in such an interesting issue where we need to bring together stakeholders. So um, I'm not going to entertain you more, and I'm going to leave the floor to the very capable hands of Linda Osuski. Please, Linda, the virtual floor is yours. And thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Um, a warm welcome to our distinguished guests and to our audience out there in the virtual space. Um, just before starting with our roundtables, um, I would like to uh, present the speakers and uh, then also if you have any questions, comments, etc. as Christina mentioned, it's very uh, welcome and you can put it also already during um, the debate, you can, put, you can put it into the chat and at the end um, we will um, uh, have the opportunity to, to, yeah, to have speak you. To have to speak to the audience uh, about what we heard about circular economic economics so far. So um, to our speakers, um, we have Andre Martinuzzi. He is professor and head of the Institute for Sustainable Management at the VU Vienna. Um, then there is uh, Miraya Canielas. Uh, she's head of the Sustainable Development Unit at the Ministry for Climate Action, Food and Rural Agenda of the Government of Catalonia. Then there's Elena Janeva. She's co-founder of uh, Hamstatic, a startup, which is developing, um, they are developing um, hemp-based um, insulation modules. And um, then we have, uh, last but not least, Harald uh, Friedel. He is a circular, he's a member of the Circular Economy Advisory Board of the World Economic Forum and the CEO of um, the, um, how is it called? We <laughs> um, of um, 
just a moment. Uh, sorry, Harald Friedel. Circle economy. Uh, I was thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So um, now we start with the first round table um, and I ask uh, Dr. Andre Martinuzzi to start with an introduction uh, into the theoretical concept of circular economy. Good afternoon. Thanks to the organizers for putting together this brilliant panel and thank you for attending this event, even in a sunny afternoon in Vienna where you could sit outside, have a drink, just have a drink in here, hopefully. So. What is circular economy? Well, it's an idea and it's a mission of change. It's the idea to change our economy from a throughput economy, harvesting, harvesting, melting, producing, delivering, selling, throwing it away. Well, that's basically what we do. We produce things to be thrown away. After using them once, twice, half a year, three years, whatever, the usage cycles get shorter and shorter. You know about this phenomenon of fast fashion. I don't know how often do you wear your shirts? On average in Europe, three and a half times. That's not very often. How many tons do you need as resources for your lifestyle? As an Austrian, on average, I need 42 tons a year. Thanks God, I do not shovel it. Otherwise I would not have to practice anymore, any kind of jog jogging or, or exercises. So we don't feel it. So we live in a throughput economy that we actually do not really feel. And the basic idea of circular economy is to change that to more circular, as the term says. Is it new? Is it new? Not at all. Not at all. It's not new. We talk about industrial ecology for 20 years. We talk about eco-design of products for 20 years. We talk about dematerialization of consumption for more than 20 years. We have a waste hierarchy on European level for several decades. We talk about social and sustainable entrepreneurship quite some long time. Well, I don't know if you've seen it, but there is even a British rock band called Muse that published a few years ago a song on unsustainable and the second law of thermodynamics. If you're interested in this, I post it into the chat forum. I show it to my students every semester to say, if you don't get it, listen to Muse. So why now? Why is circular economy now so prominent? First of all, it's about resource dependency and resource volatility. We've seen that our businesses, we have seen that our European economy heavily depends on imports more and more. We've seen that during the COVID crisis, many of these kind of supply chains broke down. We have a resilience problem and we've seen that one ship in the Suez Canal blocked it for several days and blocked 12% of the world's trade. Well, that, well, we know we have a problem because of this. And what is circular economy as well? It's a good story. It's an incredible good story. It's a really good narrative. It's a narrative that addresses policymakers as well as businesses. And that's also the, the not so good thing. It's a competing narrative to other narratives which are out there. And if I talk to businesses, they tend to get confused because they say, okay, now Greta is showing up with Fridays of Future. So we have to go for decarbonization. SDGs were agreed on global level, 190 countries signed the SDGs. So I have to do something for the SDGs. There is extinction rebellion out there. I have to do something there. There is built back better now with the Green Deal. And somebody told me they first should get the prices right and then I should start something. So we compete, there are competing narratives out there. And there's a certain tendency that the people we want to address get confused, get overloaded it gets too demanding for them. So the question is, is it the right story for the right people? And what is cut off if we just tell the story of circular economy? And we can discuss this later on. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Dr. Martinuzzi. Um, I will pass the word uh, to Mireya Canielas. Um, please. Thank you, Linda. I will share my screen. Uh, can you see it in the proper way as a presentation? Yes, it's okay, Christina. Okay, thank you very much. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much for inviting us. It's a great pleasure to be able to participate in such an interesting panel. I would like to say uh, that it's, it has been some years now since the government of Catalonia decided to boost policies around circular economy. 
not only uh, to meet global challenge, especially sustainable uh, challenge, but also as economic opportunity and as a strategy for innovation. Um, that's why we have been working in different national wide strategy, what we call umbrella strategy. Probably the most important one is the Catalan strategy on circular economy that was approved in 2015. And I have to say that right now we are uh, actualizing this strategy in a new roadmap that we hope to be approved uh, before the end of the year. But we have not only working on, on circular oriented specific strategy, but uh, we have been working a lot in order to integrate circular economy in other sectorial strategy. And in that sense, I would like to mention especially the national agreement for the Catalan industry, which has one of its axes specific uh, a focus on sustainability and circularity. So before I uh, explain some of the examples of the instruments that the Catalan government uh, has been implemented, I would like to mention that for us, the sectorial approach is very important. And that's why uh, five years ago, we have we applied the toolkit for policy making, which is a tool that de was developed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And this tool allow us to analyze the circular economy potential in the leading economical sectors. So after this analysis, we have been developing different kind of sectorial studies of all the sectors you uh, can see represented in the slides. Um, so this is the core of my presentation. And uh, I would like to say that for us, a wide range of instruments are needed to boost circular economy, going from information and assessment to business and institution, public incentive, capacity building, international participation, and uh, collaboration with the stakeholders. I don't have the time to explain all the, all the instruments we have been implemented. I will just mention some examples. Regarding information, I would like to mention that since 20 years ago, we launched the Catalan Eco Design Award, which uh, we, we present uh, once every two years. And we receive more than 100 candidatures in every edition. And we publish uh, all the best initiative uh, that we receive. So I, I encourage you to have a look to the catalog where you will find all the best initiative in eco design in Catalonia. Of course, um, public incentive it's crucial uh, in, uh, for in these aspects. And that's why during the last years, we have been developing different kind of, of incentive. We started with some eco vouchers specifically oriented for SMEs. And little by little, we have been developing other programs like Innotech or Nucleus, we are, which, are, uh, pre, uh, which are oriented for biggest projects, we, where we ask a collaboration, for example, between business and technological centers. And also two years ago, we launched uh, some loans specific on circular economy. Also, uh, uh, regarding capacity building, it's, it, it's crucial also. I'm sure Andre uh, knows very much coming from the university. And in that sense, we are organizing different kind of seminars. Some of them, we organize them with the clusters. And also we develop a program together with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in order to, to, to help business and institution to learn more about uh, circularity. Um, international cooperation is also very important in order to learn to learn for the, from abroad, uh, from the universities, from other governments, uh, where there are really um, better, in, very, better initiatives than in Catalonia. And we, that's why we collaborate in different uh, European projects. And finally, finally, I would like to say that 
collaboration with stakeholders is crucial. And in that sense, I would like to mention a couple of initiatives. First of all, we are working a lot in a, on a circular fashion agreement with the stakeholders from all the value change of the textile sector. And I also want to mention Catalonia Circular, which is an, it's an innovation hub and meeting point for companies and organizations uh, that provide solutions, strategy, and tools to consolidate circular economy in Catalonia. We don't have all the Catalonia circular in English, but we have one, one verse, some of it it's in, in English. So I encourage you to have a look because in, in this hub, we try to, to put all the tools that I have been mentioned. Uh, uh, you, you will find them on, the, on this website. And I would uh, like to- Mireya, you, yes. you, could, you could actually put the link to this, um to this uh, yes. Catalonia Circular into the chat so we can access okay. it all and see it. I and, put um, the, okay, I will put the link. In English, for the moment, you, here yeah. you have the, the general one and I'm sure the organizer will share the, the, okay. the presentation, but when I will stop, I will share the link. And finally, uh, I would like to mention that we are organizing the Circular Economy Hotspot in November this year which is its uh, unique opportunity to showcase the business initiative, governmental strategy and successful partnership that are transforming uh, and making Catalonia economy more circular. I encourage you to join us in Barcelona for these events, which we, we should have organized last year, but of course we couldn't. So we really hope that the, this November could be a, a really much more natural uh, Congress. Um, here you have all the information uh, that you will need. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mireya. Thank you much for, for this interesting uh, overview of what is uh, Catalonia doing. And it's a good um, bridge to, to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Elena Yaneva and uh, the co-founder of Hemp Static. So maybe she can tell us a bit more about the practice. Yes, thank you very much also for the invitation. It is a great pleasure to be part of this renovated panel. Uh, Hempstatic is a startup which aims to accelerate the transition from a linear to a circular economy in the construction sector. And uh, for this, we uh, look into uh, the different raw materials which uh, we can implement in order to produce innovative construction materials. Uh, and uh, we have uh, stopped our focus on the um, implementation of hemp residues, so hemp byproducts. Um, why do we do this? Well, our, uh, we have two objectives. The first one is to uh, reduce the dependence on a crude oil-based products like plastics, which are um, mostly uh, ma majorly used in the insulation sector the sector we are currently targeting with our products. Um, and the other objective is to um, introduce um, new renewable materials, which have a great potential um, to substitute partially um, Material, uh, raw materials uh, which are not renewable, precious, uh, and exhaust, an exha exhaustible resource. So on the, on the one hand, we look into the input we put into our products. Uh, so what kind of materials can we use which can be uh, recyclable and uh, in our case also biodegradable. Then from these materials, we create uh, products. Uh, which should uh, also keep the same uh, characteristics. Uh, so we uh, try to uh, create a closed feedback loop between the output we generate, the product, and the input, uh, these raw materials. Uh, this is the so-called regenerative design, uh, which we try to apply already from the beginning on, uh, from uh, the very scratch uh, development of our concept. Uh, so we are trying really to rethink uh, the usage of materials and how they flow into the value chain uh, with the goal also to keep uh, the products which we produce as long as possible in the value chain. This is why uh, the products we create can be reused or recycled after their useful life. 
And um, the third pillar which we apply is a multilateral approach. So uh, we believe in the stre strength of uh, collaborative thinking and try to involve all stakeholders along our value chain into, uh, into our innovation processes. Uh, so this means on the one side, uh, farmers uh, building companies uh, which uh, produce uh, these raw materials, um, then uh, also creating heads with whom we collaborate to create new products uh, and uh, to uh, also um, academia. So we also do research and development in order to understand what is the potential of uh, um, what is the potential of the materials that we use um, and how we can implement them best uh, into sustainable solutions. And of course, uh, the young uh, future professionals uh, who will be uh, the future developers. And um, uh, so we work together with students uh, also and uh, with schools uh, where we do uh, workshops and try to bring these topics uh, to the university with the aim to raise awareness um, on the topic of the circular economy. Thank you very much, Elena. This was really, really uh, exciting and interesting. And I already have a lot of questions, <laughs> but uh, we will pass to uh, our next speaker, Harald Friedel, who will tell us a bit, um, or who will share his insight, uh, maybe from the um, international organization's perspective. So please, it's, the floor is yours. Yeah. Great to see all of you or not see all of you, uh, because unfortunately we don't have so many screens where we can see your faces. Um, I'm dialing in from, from Amsterdam. Um, and uh, the reason why I chose to be in Amsterdam is because Holland is a front runner in the circular economy. Um, and it's a country that has said by 2050, we want to be fully circular. Um, I think the prime minister said this a couple of years ago without knowing that's actually not possible. Um, but at least it's a very ambitious goal. Um, and that's important and that's where the journey starts. Um, and it's great to see uh, so many friends and colleagues from uh, all parts of society. So from NGOs, businesses and government because only together we can make that huge shift happen. Um, I've been speaking a lot in the last years and I'm truly a student only of the circular economy as it's an evolving topic. Um, uh, it has been as Robert Andre said uh, it's not totally new, it's 30, 40 years old, um, and it has become, uh, it is a very powerful narrative. I think it was very useful to get these topics out of the environmental corner. I think that's why it was very um, powerful to get away from saying these are tree huggers, these are people who don't really care about the economy into the heart and center of the economy, because the economy needs a fundamental shift. And I don't think we need to reiterate this, the fact that 1% of the world population owns more than 99% or that we are uh, seeing a mass extinction of species and that the um, emissions are still rising and we are not able to turn really the tide shows we are in a fundamental environmental, economic and social crisis. So why am I uh, working on this? I, I found uh, circular economy as something very tangible as a clear way of implementing systems change. And that's what I like to do. Uh, it's a very complex uh, topic, but at the same time, if you look up different uh, definitions uh, in my old job as CEO of Circle Economy, that's an uh, uh, impact organization in Amsterdam with a hundred people. We boiled it down to seven pillars and I'm gonna put in the chat uh, my Instagram account so you can find a very simple framework of seven pillars that you can introduce in an organization, in a company or in a government uh, that you have uh, that you have and where you want to implement this because I believe there's one thing if there's one word you're taking away from what I say it's action 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 I at the moment um, so I was the CEO of Circle Economy we advised businesses and governments and uh, and cities on a shift from linear to circular um, so we have done hundreds of these cases and strategy consultancies um, and the, the biggest problem is that many people get uh, stuck in the definition question, but I truly believe it's not a way um, how we define the issue, but how we implement it and how we get into action. A lot of things have been mentioned. We need a new way of leadership for that. That is about radical collaboration, true transparency and accountability. Many topics we see in the current system not tackled. 
Um, and at the moment, I'm also in uh, advising the global climate change negotiations, where I'm trying to bring this very practical knowledge into, for example, industry transitions. And that's for me a very important one. In November, we have the COP26, the conference of the parties, the big climate change negotiations, maybe the most important ones ever, uh, because if we don't show now uh, real traction, we're not gonna achieve the 2050 goals. And I think in the last weeks, we have been seeing also from different countries, it's much more about the 2030 goals than the 2050 goals. And I think friends uh, like Greta Thunberg, uh, who is a constant reminder of the young generation, uh, says it's just not enough and funny pictures are just not uh, giving us any satisfaction anymore. So I love to have an uh, active uh, conversation with all of you and also remind ourselves that the circular economy that some already consider is very transformative and maybe even revolutionary comes with many issues. And just today there was a, um, um, an article in the Harvard Business Review that talks about the limits of a sustainable and a circular economy. And I think, so it's not one fits all solution. It's also not a goal in itself. It's a roadmap. It's an action plan that we can create with the circular economy. And this is how it should be seen. It's a tool. Truly, we should think, and I think books like the Donut Economics by my friend Kate Rayworth are really inspiring pieces. We have to think how we make the economy really regenerative. That's for me the, the, the play for the future. Circular economy can be very helpful in this, but let's not lose track. It's only a way and a step forward from a very difficult system that has proven to be very rigid and because of vested interests often also difficult to change, but I invite you all to be part of this change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harald. It was uh, very inspiring your presentation. So um, now I'm going, uh, we are going now to the second part of our roundtable and I will ask uh, each speaker some questions. Um, and I would like to start, start with uh, Elena Yaneva from Hempstatic. So um, like when I heard uh, what you said about your company and the ideas and the design, it's, I mean, I thought, why, why does, doesn't it uh, exist already? Or why isn't it like mainstream? already so um so where do you see as a as an entrepreneur where do you see the barriers and difficulties for companies in applying circular economy concepts mm -hmm. uh, well i have to say that it's uh, a lot of work to be done <laughs> so maybe uh, this is the first step that uh, we need to prepare ourselves uh, to to get uh, to put put power into, into the creation and into the realization of this concept. And I can only agree with uh, what Harold said about uh, the necessity of collaboration between the different stakeholders, players, between the end users, uh, policy makers. And uh, I was uh, 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 lucky enough uh, to be able to attend a workshop also together with, uh, uh, which was led by Kate Raworth, uh, where uh, we explore um, explored uh, the donut economics model and um, this is uh, for example a tool which helped us to grasp uh, the meaning and uh, the difficulties which were related to the implementation so I would say uh, firstly um, it, it would help to uh, raise awareness uh, on these issues uh, and to involve um, educational parties, especially uh, into, into the dis dissemination of, of these processes and these problems. Um, because at the, at the university level, for instance, this is still not a central topic. And this is where the young uh, professionals are coming from. So we want uh, these people to be equipped uh, with the uh, power and uh, with the tools to know how to uh, make change uh, throughout their professional career. Um, another uh, restriction uh, that uh, I see, for example, in the construction sector are a lack of experimental data in to some extent uh, and of certain standards and regulations which are now, st now starting slowly to be formulated and developed, but they have to be backed up, of course, with experimental data. And um, as uh, Andre said in the beginning, the circular economy is maybe not a, such a new field uh, for uh, like not a new topic to, uh, to, to be discussed on, uh, but it's still a new approach which um, big industries need to adopt in order to um, 
yeah, in order to adapt their processes from a linear to a circular manner. So uh, this is another challenge that I see. Um, and uh, one of the solutions, of course, proposed by uh, uh, to, to solve this challenge may be related to certification. And this is also, um, yeah, a, a point where one can say, yes, it is challenging because certification processes or how, how can we actually differentiate which products are really circular and green and, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, which products will be greenwashed, so to say, uh, and certification uh, is still a very costly process and also a very lengthy one. Um, so maybe creating, creating incentives also for uh, smaller companies uh, uh, with smaller budgets to to be able to promote their products as circular or as green uh, could uh, make a difference, especially on the market, uh, where they have to compete, of course, with uh, more wealthy companies with um, a, a big market shares. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you, Elena. That, that was a very interesting point of view, uh, also uh, regarding the, the topic of certification and the costs for, for like smaller companies. Um, so um, I would like to um, ask uh, Mireya Canelas, um, where are the challenges for, for institutions um, to implement a circular economy? Thank you, Linda. Well, our main challenge is to set the conditions for a green recovery. I mean, changing the economic model is very complex, as it has been said, but it's necessary. So in the short term, we are faced with the challenge of smartly investing the European funds coming from the new generation EU uh, in major strategic projects that help us to really deal with this transformation that it's not easy at all. So which are the main difficulties or the main barriers? For us, there are mainly three. The first of all, it's scalability because we have plenty of really sucks best practices, but we have to change the real, the, the global model. So scalability is the main barrier. The second is to improve. Sorry, sorry, I, I will, I am, um, the, the question of scalability, can you define it a yeah. bit uh, yeah. more precisely? Yeah. I mean that we have a lot of best practices. We have really innovative um, businesses in Catalonia and all, all, all over Europe, but we haven't changed yet the model, the, the ecosystems. So there is no enough with success stories or best practices. We have to change all the, all the, all the value chain. That's why this is a real, a real challenge and a, a great difficulty that we have to deal with. The second is to improve legislation. I mean, the European Commission has, is working a lot and it helped a lot at a Catalan level, uh, all the legislation in Europe. But for example, in Spain and in Catalonia, we need to favor byproducts. The byproduct condition is still difficult. I mean, if one industry has a waste, is it still difficult for another industry to take this waste and use it as a, as a resource? So there is the need to improve the legislation to make it uh, possible. And the third um, barrier is, is a better multi-level and multi-stakeholder co coordination. It has been already mentioned, but I think there is the room to even improve coordination between stakeholders. And some of the projects that we are we are developing uh, to to meet those challenges are, for example, to develop shared agendas uh, in order to to work together with stakeholders. And a good example is the textile agreement that I also mentioned. Another another good project is the roadmap. For us, it's a very strategic initiative. Another is to consolidate Catalonia Circular to scale up successful projects and to, to favor the development of public-private partnership, which are also needed. Uh, also, uh, we, we, 
we, we have the room to take advantage of enabling technologies like artificial intelligence or ECT to accelerate circularity. This is another opportunity. And also it's very important to change consumer and user patterns that would favor circular economy strategy. And finally, we are working a lot to consolidate a circular sector you know, that able to provide solution for all this new market that is, is, is innovating so much. So those are some of the projects, the most strategic projects that the government is promoting in order to, to meet this big challenge of the green recovery. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Mireya. Um, so I will uh, go on with uh, Dr. Martinuzzi. Um, yeah, you said it already. It's like uh, all the tools are obviously there since many, many years, but um, like we don't use them apparently. But now we are waking up and starting to recognize the importance. So maybe you could um, give us from your scientific point of view um, what, what has to be done um, that all these uh, circular economy tools are really implemented by, by companies and policymakers and the society as well. Well, I would say, as Maria said before, we have different levels that we address, different levels of change, and some are easier, although they are difficult, than others. When we talk about new technologies, new production technologies, any kind of um, usage of secondary raw material and so on, then it's quite easy. I know it's difficult to shift to renewable resources. I know about the whole debate of bioeconomy to replace every kind of non-renewable substance by a new, renewable one. Um, I see that in Horizon Europe, for example, a lot of money goes into technologies, into circular economy technologies. So it seems to be a kind of easy fix to fix this on a technology level and to say, consumers, you buy whatever you like, we fix it on the production side. The products will stay with the same quality. Um, you can have the same consumption patterns. We will fix it for you. Um, that's a quite easy level. And to my impression, this also has some trade-offs. For example, now, if we want to shift because of decarbonization of our economy to more electricity instead of carbon-based energy, instead of oil, instead of coal, uh, we, have, we need some uh, raw materials for that, for the batteries. We have some conflict minerals that we need. So we actually replace carbon emissions by human right violation in many cases. So we do something better while worsening it to a certain extent. If you're interested in this, I will post a link to a project we currently coordinate on especially that. If we go one level higher, we talk about the products. We design different products. For example, products which are repairable, where there is no plant obsolescence in it. So then perhaps the product Pro uh, properties will change. The use of product will change. So this means we need the cons consumer. If the consumers do not accept this product, it will not work. And to my experience, it's very difficult to persuade companies to think about new products. To think about different production technologies, easy. Many companies like to talk about that. It's about technology, okay. But if the environmental manager wants to touch upon the product design, many companies say, don't touch it. It's not your responsibility. As, an, as a sustainability manager, it's up to you to think about the SDGs, to take care of the environmental management system and to report with GRI. That's it. So many of these environmental managers, they manage downward, inward and backward, and they're not allowed to touch upon the forward looking things. So that's a challenge. Then we go if one if we go one level higher and we already have the consumer on board, perhaps we should not just tell the consumer that's a new product. Now it's circular. We should talk about consumption patterns. We should talk about behavior. We should talk about fast fashion cycles. We should talk about dematerializing well-being, dematerializing consumption. Perhaps you're much more happy if you don't buy so much stuff, but you have more time. So then we touch upon values what is accepted in our society, what is successful in our society. So this opens the door to a lot of societal issues that, short footnote, are currently completely ignored in the upcoming Horizon Europe program, which is definitely oriented towards technology. It's the easy fixes. If we go one level higher, we need the right policies for that. So what kind of policies do we need? 
Do we need a lot of carrots or might we have any sticks? What sticks do you have in your basket in Catalonia? I've seen a lot of instruments, all of them are carrots. No sticks. You don't change any prices. No touch of So if we have one big steering mechanism, which is prices, and then we have a flyer and then we have awareness raising and we do a lot of things with children and education and the prices are completely the same we and we still scratch our heads and say why don't people change behavior why do companies not change behavior yeah because of the prices it's quite easy if you change prices you have winners and losers the winners are always well organized the, lo the, the losers are well organized they cry out immediately and very loud the winners are not well organized because they don't even know that they're winners. They might be the entrepreneurs of tomorrow. Nowadays, they're students. They don't even know that they would be the big winners. The losers, they know. They sit in the lobby organizations. They sit in the chambers of commerce and they are quite loud. Next, last level, changing whole systems, including all of this into one attempt to change technologies, products, business models, behavior, policies at the same time. Now, that would be interesting. I think that we currently live embedded in systems, in very, very different systems. We have a healthcare system, a food system, a mobility system, or whatever. And system is much more than a nice term. I know a lot of people who try to be smart by putting system at the end of each sentence. They don't say, I'm starving. They say, I have a problem with the food system here. So then they seem super smart. But when we talk about systems, it means the interrelated phenomenon of different societal actors. And these systems emerged they were never designed on purpose. There was no big designer sitting in there and saying, we design a financial system that it will blow up in 2008. No, this was not financial market suicide bomber. This was an embedded, well, it's, it's a bug. It's a systemic bug. And we're surrounded by systemic bugs. We've seen it in the COVID crisis. We've seen it when the ship hit the Suez Canal. So how to make systems aware that they are a system so how can we empower systems to recognize that they are systems? At the moment, we have this phenomenon of the elephant in the room. Well, at least the elephant knows that it's an elephant. Perhaps the others don't know. In our case, the elephant doesn't know that it's an elephant. The elephant, part of the elephant thinks his whatever, a leg, and the other part thinks it's a tail, and they don't even know that it's an elephant. So let's make the elephant aware that it's an elephant, first of all. So self-awareness of whole systems. Second, empowering whole systems for designing themselves and then supporting them in changing whole systems. Sounds easy, super difficult. We need a lot of tools and a lot of research how this can be done. And that's not pure technology. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Martinuzzi. That was really um, also very, very um, inspiring. And I want to give Ma Mireya the possibility to, to maybe to respond or reply to what Dr. Martinuzzi uh, said, if, if you like. Uh, uh, I completely agree. I completely agree. The difficulty is how Catalonia had, can move the prices for example, we are working a lot on uh, the textile agreement. We are working hard to implement an, an, a, a, a responsible, uh, I don't know how to say, responsible amplification system, a wrap, a scrap system. I think this is a stick, but it's almost impossible to change the price model in a region. Even maybe in Europe, it's difficult. I mean, I'm, I'm quite proud to be in Europe because I know that Europe is pushing a lot and it helps a lot to, for, uh, for my country and my territory. But I mean, prices are so global. Uh, talking about fashion, for example, it's so difficult to move to to stop the, 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 the fast fashion model in a in a in a small territory so we really have to work work globally and is it that it's difficult it's difficult <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you Mireya um yeah I will I will pass the question also to Harald Friedel who who is uh, also um yeah impacting so maybe could you give us uh, your view on on what was said until now and uh, also maybe a uh, um, vision for the future like how could 2030 or 2050 uh look like 
from from okay. the circular economic point first of view. First, I have to say something about uh, repeating the word difficult. I think I made myself notes. Now it came up like fifty times in the last uh, in the last uh, remarks. Sure, it's difficult, but the choice is not difficult or not. The choice is doing the right thing or not. I just want to remind everybody because otherwise it sounds like a scary story. And I think the fundamental thing why a circular economy for me appeals and for many companies is because we want to future proof not only ourselves as people, but also the businesses and organizations we live in and the countries. And the future proof means for me not looking at the bottom line. That's why the system, and I agree with you, the system is really, really rigged and not set up in a smart way. Um, and it's not set up by design, uh, Professor, I agree with you. Um, but if we engage in that way, it gives us an opportunity to think beyond ourselves, which per se makes life much more interesting. I just want to make this, put this very fundamental issue out there. If it's difficult or not, it, that's a secondary question for me, especially in a year where we know the circular economy can deliver more than half of the gap that we still have in the emissions uh, that are not delivered through the current uh, projections from different countries. So please, everybody who listens, difficult, sure, but it makes you much more happy. It's an economy that can provide for much more equality and therefore happiness. I had to say that. I think it would be, uh, if you ask me for a master plan, I would tomorrow uh, give every country in the world, and we did, I think, five to seven countries, including Norway, um, uh, Austria, uh, Finland, ro a roadmap for a circular economy. I think that's really important. Mireya, what you said, the hotspots is a fantastic way of how to organize civil society, business, and, uh, um, and governments in a collaborative way, in a way that is not the government tells the businesses something to do, but truly work together in a new way. Um, these roadmaps often don't exist yet. Plus, where they exist, they are not fully harmonized with the climate change roadmaps. So this is something we have to really drive very hard, these interlinkages between climate uh, and circular economy, to my mind. Um, I want to end a bit with a, with a note that uh, um, one and a half years ago, before COVID, at the last climate um, um, uh, the climate change week in New York, I remember three um, three people saying three important things, and I want to repeat them here because I believe for the way forward, this is kind of shaping the debate. One is that uh, uh, the Secretary General of the UN said, who issues red alert after red alert after red alert that we are on the wrong path. He said, don't show up with words, show up with actions. I think that's something important that we should all remind ourselves tomorrow. When you go into your company, you can actually change it step by step. Circular economy is a fantastic uh, tool for that. Two, there are young leaders that should sit on every table here, also on this panel. Uh, should uh, and, and how uh, Greta asked everybody, how dare you still show up to these meetings? I think that's something that is very deeply ingrained in, um, uh, in me too. Um, there is no more way of saying this is too complicated, the definitions are not right, we just have to break through that. Um, and the third one, which came from the Japanese environment minister, which I think is a fantastic quote, he said, we truly have to make the transition sexy. And that coming from a Japanese was a big surprise, but at the same time, I think he's right. If we still make this a very, um, it's something that is not fun or not um, um, appealing to everybody, we have to have FOMO, the fear of missing out of doing the right thing. That's why I wanted to um, make this remark about difficult or not is not the thing. We really have to change the narrative. It's something that has to happen. And the more interesting we make it, the more sexy we make it, the more people we will get to engage. To get to 20% in our population who actually really care about circular economy and re really care about regenerative business models. So thank you for the opportunity to share with you. And I'd love to have much more time to debate with you all. Yeah, thank you, Harald. Uh, maybe some of the speakers want to, to add something. Um, there were many interesting um, points. So yeah, I see Dr. Martinuzzi uh, raised the hand. So please. Got a question to Harald. Um, well, uh, to my experience, there's a long discussion about sustainable development for decades. And we know about all of these three pillars. And I think there are three different societal narratives standing behind it. One is ecology. One is environmental protection. One is uh, protect the world. 
where well, the story is quite strong because nowadays we talk about the Anthropocene. You could also call it catastrophe caused by humans. Uh, actually, what we do right now has the same impact as a big extinction. We live in the time of the big extinction. The sixth one, the previous five ones were asteroids. And we actually say we're smarter than asteroids. I doubt. We're as stupid as a stone as society. Individuals might be super smart, but as a, as a society, we behave in a quite stupid way. We have the same impact as an asteroid impact, slower and perceive ourselves as smarter. So protecting something, that's a good narrative. That's a narrative of uh, Extinction Rebellion. That's the narrative of Greater Thunberg, protecting the earth for future generations. Then we have the economic narrative. The economic narrative is, yes, but we have, to, we have to survive. We have to deliver something. We have to fulfill the needs of people. We have to create jobs. We have to ensure prosperity. It's about profitable. It's about efficient. So it's all about making the machine running. Um, and if we have a trade-off between protecting the future and feeding the present generation, we always feed the present generation, for sure because they are the ones that buy our goods. They are ones that go to the election nowadays. Future generations are not represented nowadays, neither in financial markets nor during elections. So this is the nice story of so saying circular economy is protecting the future and making business now. It's a kind of eco efficiency thing. So it's, it's bridging the two things, not having a trade-off anymore. And the third one is about society. It's about all of these societal benefits, societal goals. And there I got the feeling, and this results from an interview I had with Ken Webster from El MacArthur Foundation. He quite straightly said, we got rid of the societal aspects to promote the circular economy story because it's smarter than the sustainable development goal story because the sustainable development story is a political story. It's about equality. It's about what, as you said, happiness. It's about peace. It's about these are societal goals. How to translate it to the business level. Business might say, well, peace, yes, peace, thank you. We hope for it, but what shall we do? So he said it was a kind of mainstreaming of the story for the environment and the economy and get rid of these challenged things we did not even agree on society. Because when you say equality, well, are you Scandinavian? They like equality. If you talk about equality in the US, you're a communist. So we did not even agree on what we mean by equality. And to my impression, the smart idea of circular economy was to get rid of these terms. And now you try to justify or to sell or whatever circular economy mid equality and happiness. I'm astonished. It's Thank great you, to astonish a professor. That's always good. And it's a longer conversation. But if you look into, um, so I'm, not, I'm known as a very global and vocal person about this topic. And I love that you talk about it because it comes to the heart of the matter. That's the reason why I think the EMF, the El MacArthur Foundation story is limited in its transformational potential. If we wanna reach people, we need to provide for a totally new narrative, not do things a little bit less bad. That's the story of a circular economy core, very small. I believe in a circular economy story that provides for a regenerative and a redistributive economy. I spoke to this at, at Chatham House and the investment banker next to me called me, uh, are you a socialist or a communist? And it's fantastic to be called a socialist or communist by an investment banker because I don't believe these people have the best for society at their interest. Now, I believe what we did in Amsterdam, starting with the question, what is the best for the citizens of Amsterdam? Then we choose a model and then we choose the tools how to get there. But you're gonna to get to very different aspects and questions when you ask, how does the city look like that is truly providing for the citizen? So yes, I wanna push the agenda because we don't have more time to do a little bit less bad, but fundamentally better. And that's why I said the circular economy is a good aspect of that story, but it's not sufficient because we need to push for regenerative models that are not part of this. And I put this interesting link into the, into the comment. And I got a little bit um, also very deep because when you look into what people actually want, they want connection, they want love, all these things that are very airy-fairy, but they are in the SDG somehow as a political, uh, uh, in, after political process, uh, in a compromise, they are enshrined there. So yes, for me, the circular economy story is a great step forward, but it's not the whole story. We have to really go much faster. And that's why I'm making the comment, go into the circular economy, but explore much more 
deeply into a regenerative model. And I hope we can continue the conversation, Professor. Thank you. Yeah, it's very, uh, really exciting. And I see, I feel there's a lot of energy here. <laughs> um, maybe I, I, I just was thinking about um, something that maybe wasn't mentioned because we, were, we are talking about um, the business side on the one hand and then the society and environment on the other hand, but there's still this argument also we hear at the EU level is this level playing field that we hear so much. And then we have also like not only the EU, but there are many, uh, many other global regions um i mean how how can we there get to to a common point i mean they all like the whole planet agreed on the on the on the climate uh, change fight but um in practice i guess there are really different levels in each region so so how could we um like uh put there a common level to 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 on a planetary level I don't know who wants to <laughs> um, has an opinion on, on, on this question. Well, if nobody else less would like to, but I would like to give enough time and floor to others. Um, first of all, I think that we have a global problem that needs global negotiation systems and global governance. Before setting up global governance, we need to learn from each other, which means a lot about policy learning. And I think this happens quite a lot at European level between different regions and also between different member states. Problem is that we turned things around during the last two, three decades. First, we had policy and then it had economy embedded into policy. Policy was the bigger game, economy was the smaller game. This is why we had some elections, because we wanted to have our representatives designing the rules of the game and then the businesses to play the game. It's similar as we agree on a game called Monopoly and then we start playing it. And while we play it, we don't question the rules. We play it and all businesses have to play on the level of, the, of, of their game. The question of designing the rules is a question of democracy. It's a question of policy negotiations. Uh, it turned around during the last 20, 30 years. Now, economy is the global game and competition is the global game. And we elect our prime ministers because they are best managers for our competitiveness towards China, the US and so on. So we elect managers on a global competitive game. And I think that's quite strange. The question, how can we get back our kind of authority as citizens? How do we organize this? So I think it's much more a question of democracy than of technology. If we frame the whole problem as a technology problem, it's just the easy fixes. And I completely agree to what Harold said, and I really like the, his statement to say it's much more than that. But if we start, Discussing this, we end up with discussing very fundamental issues of our economy. We start discussing the growth paradigm. And as some of you are from Catalonia, you know that there's the degrowth movement in Catalonia and in Spain. And it's difficult to talk about degrowth on the one hand. Well, actually, we know what exponential growth is now after COVID. Everybody knows. What does exponential growth mean? Oh, this was quite fast. This was everything what we learned about these exponential growth rates. Three days ago, just a cluster, then it was case, case, cluster, cluster, boom, lockdown. This is exponential growth. It's mathematics. And we have policymakers and businesses that simply say, we know it's not feasible exponential growth, but still we need it. It reminds me of this old joke that was told, our uncle thinks he's a hen. And they say, well, didn't you go to the psychotherapist? And they said, no, 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 we need the eggs. We need the eggs. It doesn't work, but we need the eggs. We know it doesn't work, but we need the jobs. We know it doesn't work, but we have to grow out of poverty. We have to grow out of debt and we have to grow out of social conflict. And this is why we're growth addicted right now, all around the globe. And I think that a circle economy with a growth paradigm doesn't go together. But how can we start discussing this after a COVID crisis when we have to restart everything, when we have millions of people unemployed and everybody's afraid of losing its, 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 its properties, its jobs, whatever. So I think it's a chance to restart, to build back better. Perhaps we should build forward better and not back. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Martinuzzi. Um, 
Yeah, we are, I have uh, incoming questions here. Um, there's one uh, from Mark. Uh, he's a medical student and um, he's asking, what are the contributions of healthcare sector to contribute to circular economy? This is the first question. And the second question, uh, do you have any sources or examples of businesses or governments applying it in the healthcare field? And third question, could it play an important role in the change of the narrative frame as Harald said? So um, I don't know if Harald Friedel or Dr. Martinuzzi or um, Miraya have examples um, for the healthcare sectors. I don't have, well, uh, we have, uh, let's say, um, not really transformative, but uh, thanks, thanks to the COVID situations has appeared a different kind of situation where uh, medical uh, material is mo much more reused. So yes, we have one. I, I I will have a look to the website, and I will now I remember to a textile company which is called Axioma, who is building textile uh, text textile for surgery and so on that can be reused for eighty or one hundred times. So I think it's it's quite a good example, and also there are different kind of mask that has been developed to be reused, not, uh, not one single use mask. But uh, I don't know more, much more transformative uh, best practices. But I will have a look to the two uh, companies right now and I will put it on the chat. Thank you, Mireya. Maybe Harald or Dr. Matiluzzi uh, have um, no of any... I don't I don't know. I don't have any first-hand experience, but I had a very interesting interview with an American colleague who told me some insights about uh, Obamacare. And it was his story. I put his name into the chat. And he told me that we as Europeans often perceive Obamacare as a kind of broader coverage of healthcare for people who didn't have healthcare before. And he told me, yeah, but it's more. So if we've got any guests from the US, please tell me and I will learn more about that. He told me that before Obamacare, uh, hospitals were paid per treatment, per treatment of a patient. And with Obamacare, they are now paid for healthy people living in their surrounding. So it's no longer about treatment, it's about health protection. And now American hospitals teamed up with gyms, with with, with, with healthy food providers to increase the healthiness of their people live in their surrounding. And that's a systemic change. This is what I meant by systemic change. Uh, it changes the business model of a hospital and it has not so much to do with circular economy, but these kind of changes could also be applied with circular economy so that the benefits and the profits do no longer depend on throughput, but depend on quality. Uh, thank you, Dr. Matuzzi. That was really interesting because I heard uh, about uh, the Chinese uh, traditional medical system uh, used to be like this. Like the doctors were actually um, like paid when the patients were healthy. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, we have another incoming question, um, but maybe it, uh, Maria Orovic, maybe you could uh, uh, say the question because I don't know you're referring to, to the industry 5.5 point zero of the um, of the European Commission expert working group so maybe you can you can explain it in your own words is there Maria or yeah hello can you hear Hi. me yes yes we can hear you hello good afternoon uh, yes it's a, in fact it's a working group of the European Commission uh, I have sent you a link you have many information in internet and they took very very often of human centric um, they're working now, apparently, yeah, they want to put citizens at the center of recovery, but it's not clear to me. I mean, when I read them, when you when I hear, hear them, it's it's great. They're very capable people, but I, when I read them, um, they mainly talk about technology. So uh, my question is, if you know them, what's your impression on their work? Thanks. And thank, thank you very you. much for, for the event. Very interesting. 
Uh, thank you, Maria. Um, so the question was directed uh, to um, to Harald and and uh, Dr. Martinuzzi. Yeah, or anyone who knows about this group. So, so do you do you know about this group, any of you, and can can tell us something? Uh, put it in the chat already. I don't. I didn't see that paper yet before. Okay. Good. So, um, are there any other questions from the from the audience? Okay, I see not no uh, incoming questions. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Thank you very much for this really really interesting. And ah, I see. Ah, I see. Uh, just a question came in, so we will take that. Um, it's uh, for all the speakers, and uh, it's uh, Nadine Meisel. Uh, she's asking, expanding these inspiring thoughts beyond ourselves. What is our human essence? How could our planet or environment and humanity beyond humans look like? Beyond growth, beyond consumption, beyond producing. Any ideas on that? So, I don't know if anyone wants to answer this. I want really to start a very long debate. <laughs> very far beyond. <laughs> First of all, I think you should invite Yuval Harari. I think he would be the right to discuss this, the right person. You know, Sapiens and Homo Deus and two challenges to the 21st century. I would really love to have such a workshop with him. If you could, could get hold of him, I'm in anyway. Um, second, I think we're in a big, in a big moment in time to think will humanity be a disaster to the earth or will we find a way not being that and i think um, greta thunberg is absolutely right we don't have a lot of time left when we see the development of the uh, co2 missions when we see the development of climate change it's not a lot of time left and with all respect to the policymakers and businesses that set up targets for 2050 really 2050 that's more than 25 years to go. Do you really think we can save the world when we set targets from 25 years from now? I don't think so. We need action now. And I completely share this view of Harald that we have to start tomorrow. Setting targets 2050 is wonderful. Where are the smart objectives for 2025, 2030, 2040? Where are the indicators? Where are the review and evaluation cycles? Where we see if we are on track or not. So we know out of other areas of policy that we have to have indicators, review, evaluation cycles. We know it from business level. We know it from other policy areas. We need it for circular economy as well. It's not enough to set targets, which are so far away that the ones who set the targets now have the good PR and will not live when they are not achieved. So it's very easy to set targets for 2050. We need to be much, much, much faster. The other question that's also a little bit philosophical that came to my mind during the last year is the question of, well, how can we self-govern our society, our economy? Is, does this work with democracy? Does this work? We, I talked to a lot of people who were into empowering people and social innovation and all of that stuff with the underlying storyline, involve the people, then it would get better. And these guys said, well, after Trump, Brexit, and so on, we doubt that if you involve all the people, the decisions will get better. So wh where are we going to? Into the direction of a kind of online populism, populism 4.0, where we always listen to what's in the, in, the, in the social media and then get the right sentence of the right actor, uh, which is called policymaker at the right time. Are we as a crowd really intelligent? We always think about crowd intelligence. Anybody thought about crowd stupidity? Um, do we need artificial intelligence to take the decisions? Is artificial intelligence better than mankind? Would this be the right way if we develop as mankind a brain for humanity? Because as an individual brain, it doesn't work. That's a little bit irritating, this idea. <laughs> But isn't it as irritating that people vote against their own interest and against all the experts and say, no, we will stick to Brexit because of the red bus and the figures on the red bus, which were total crap. So 
I'm a little bit concerned after COVID if we as a society are able to steer ourselves. So thank you uh, for this um, last words. I will uh, now lead to the finish because we are now far above the time. <laughs> So it was really, really interesting and so many um, really uh, exciting inputs. And also your last words were a bit pessimist, maybe. <laughs> I, I think, uh, as we see, humans uh, still have a big, um, uh, volo like, uh, how do you say, a will to survive. And I, and, um, I think uh, we should believe in, in, uh, in the humans that they will find solutions and we here in the panel we had a lot of um brilliant ideas and and brilliant people speaking and having uh, ideas for the future and also doing already action so i am confident and i think uh, uh, all are sharing this that uh, a new generation is coming up and uh, so i i'm really confident that uh, things like the circular economy will get more and more importance and it is already today so so thank you very much for this really interesting panel and uh, thank you to the audience and the questions. And um, yeah, I wish you a nice evening and pass the words, the last words to Christina. Yes, last but not least, thank you very much, uh, Linda. A big uh, thanks to all of you speakers who have uh, shared so generously your knowledge, your expertise and for your patience and your thoughts on quite uh, deep questions. Obviously, this is uh, also a philosophical debate, a background debate, a, a basic question debate uh, besides the practical debate. And it seems that the timing is not easy uh, to connect both things uh, at the same time. But uh, I agree with Linda. And uh, maybe it's just because uh, I'm always optimist. I guess most of us here are. If not, we wouldn't be involved in this uh, panel and this discussion and participating that we're going to look for ways to make it happen. I'm just gonna uh, wanted just to mention some keywords uh, that we're gonna take with us: roadmap, action, also especially uh, needed by governments now. I guess better yesterday, but it's now together globally collaboration, future proof, uh, system change, and difficulties are there to be overcome. No easy fixes. So um, and more democracy. Uh, that's also a very interesting point. And, yeah, I just want to kind of like, uh, you know, mention that uh, Catalonia actually is making a big effort in this regard. Uh, for sure, it's not enough, but we're going to keep working on it and actually we're taking the COVID crisis as a chance also for a transition to a more sustainable economy, because uh, it's obvious that this is absolutely necessary. Um, to make also this event a bit more sustainable, like I said before, we kind of want to help as well the networking, because this is what is necessary to do things together, to ch make changes together. So we're going to um, provide you with the links uh, that have been posted here in the chat. We are also going to uh, send you the websites. Uh, anybody who's interesting and in continuing the debate or the discussion with any of our panelists uh, or even amongst each other, please don't hesitate to send us an email. And we also hope to welcome you in any of our next uh, debates that we will announce with newsletters and with invitations. So we are always uh, happy to be in touch with all of you. And we're also happy about feedbacks. Uh, we are trying to improve. Uh, we're here uh, to serve, so to say. So please also feel free to get back to us, any of you, with any constructive uh, feedback. So um, a big thanks again. Let's leave it here. Enjoy what is left of the wonderful afternoon. And uh, well, let's keep a positive view and energy view on the future. Thank you very much to all of you. Goodbye. Adeo.